Well, good afternoon, and welcome to our workshop about MT Engage. My name is Mary Hopschwelly, and I'm a member of the History Department, and I'm proud to serve as the director of MT Engage. I'm here with my colleague. This is my name is Scott McDaniel. I teach mathematics and statistics for university studies, and I am the assessment coordinator for MT Engage. For the we were wondering um, who you were, too. Um, so if perhaps you could tell us who you are, what department you're with, uh, maybe a course that you might be considering developing for MT Engage. That would be really helpful as well. I'm left-handed, so I'm going to start over here. Oh. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us who you are and why you're here and what you hope to gain from our uh, presentations. And um, we are hope that we're going to leave plenty of time to answer questions and get feedback from you as well. And uh, you should have um, out on the tables with you uh, a handout version of the presentation. It doesn't um, took out some of the, the purely visual slides. You should also have a copy of the rubric that we are using in MT Engage courses and a uh, faculty interest form should you want to let us know that you're interested in having that class uh, that you're thinking about designated officially as an MT Engage course. Uh, especially for those of us who have been around for a while, we've seen all of these signs. We still see all these signs. There are a few here at the LTITC as well about MT Engage, the blue sign on the left, um, announcing uh, our program and what it's about, and then um, our graphic, our infographic, which is about <coughs> integrative thinking and reflection. And as we'll see today, that's really at the heart of our program. So uh, what we, Scott and I would like to do this afternoon is to answer that question, what on earth is MT Engage and why are, are we here to talk about it today? Uh, then I'll talk a little bit more about the program itself and different facets of the program. Uh, Scott's going to talk with us more about integrative thinking and reflection and the ePortfolio. And, and then I'll bounce back in to talk about what this might mean for you, uh, your students and as well as for you your, as faculty members and for your departments. So what is MT Engage and why do we have this? Now this is really sort of the technical background, um, if you will, the, for MT Engage, which is our university's official quality enhancement plan. Um, we are accredited by... Southern Association of Colleges and Schools and their Commission on Colleges. And, you know, over the last several years, we've been through this major uh, reaffirmation of accreditation endeavor uh, that culminated in the spring with our on-site visit. But as you know from going through all of that, it's not enough just to tell SACS what you want to achieve and how you achieve it as a university, what you do well, but you have to tell them what you do well and what you want to work on to make better. So that's the background for the Quality Enhancement Plan. And so as part of the uh, reaffirmation of our accreditation, we were also having this uh, very uh, extensive, uh, broad-based endeavor to develop a Quality Enhancement Plan that would reflect the strengths that we have here at MTSU and identify a need that our enhancement plan would try to address. As part of this, the MT Engage program also has to be aligned with our academic master plan. And this is actually how I came to MT Engage. I was not involved in the development process, but rather I was serving on the academic master plan committee and chaired the academic quality subcommittee of the AMP. Um, and uh, Sheila Otto, there in the back, was a member of our subcommittee. And we had a lot of crossover between the uh, QEP development group and the AMP group. And what we found was a lot of synergy, a lot of common ideas coming to the fore of what faculty really felt strongly about and wanted to see happen on this campus. And we, we noted in the academic master plan the need to strengthen our academic community. Um, to make students feel that they are part of our academic community as a way to strengthen then, uh, that academic culture. So the QEP itself is a five-year project. 
um, that, during which we will be engaged in not just implementing the plan that was developed, but we will uh, be uh, putting Scott to work with continuous assessment of the plan as we move forward, reflecting on our own work and seeing what we would like to adapt as we move through. And the goal, though, is for this not to be, you know, five years, oh, you know, five and done, we just move on. Uh, but as EXL did before us, mm -hmm. EXL was our first university QEP, um, that this become an embedded practice at the university, something that we can all be a part of. So here, and this is the most cogent statement of what MT Engage is about. We want to enhance students' academic engagement. So we're using that engagement link to that academic culture. How do we get students involved, taking ownership of their own learning? Um, and we do have to establish a program outcome. Um, you know, there are many different ways we could talk about engagement. And in fact, you'll see that we're willing to use many different uh, venues, methods, practices, pedagogies to support student engagement. But what is it we want that engagement to do for our students? Um, that the QEP Development Committee narrowed down to integrative thinking and reflection. And this goes back to the QEP development process. As I said a minute ago, uh, in the QEP you want to build on your strengths. Students told us, and we hear this from faculty too, Faculty are good at what they do. Faculty are already using um, engagement practices in their classrooms. Um, you talked about EXL, great example of that. Many um, other endeavors going on on campus. But what is it that students feel a need for and that faculty recognize? Um, helping students answer that question, why am I in this class? What, what does my entire academic program actually mean? How is it all supposed to fit together? Um, you know, now, we can answer all of those questions for them, I'm sure. Um, but how could we help them develop the answers to those questions instead of us simply telling them, oh, here's why you're taking, in my case, uh, Tennessee history. I teach that like Dr. Sayward. So we want to use integrative thinking and reflection to help students develop the ability to see connections, make connections across multiple contexts, the classes they're taking any given semester, the classes that they take throughout their academic program, but, and different kinds of educational experiences, not just in the classroom, but outside the classroom, and um, see how those all cohere together so that they get at the end of their program and they know who they are, what they can do, what they know, and that's what they present then as they move forward in the rest of their lives. If you guys have any questions during the middle of this, feel free to oh, yeah. please, please. pipe up. Thank you. Thank you. So um, what actually then are we implementing here? Because fall 16 is our first semester of full implementation of our five years. Um, our courses and our program really sort of reflect the same components. The integration of high-impact pedagogies, beyond-the-classroom experiences, integrated thinking and reflection, and then the creation of a, a, a student work that goes into the ePortfolio on D2L. So high-impact engagement pedagogies, um, this is sort of the official list from the American Association of Colleges and Universities based on George Ku's work. E-portfolios have just been added as an official high-impact pedagogy or practice or high-impact engagement practice. And you see here EXL is one of these. That's why courses can be designated both EXL and MT Engage. Um, learning communities, you can have a learning community that is MT Engage and EXL and or honors. Undergraduate research. Because, of course, they, we want intellectual engagement, civic engagement, community engagement, any form of engagement. So we're not, you know, we're looking at a very broad array of practices here. It's not just, you know, having fun in class, having activities in class. It, oh. is, it is all of this. I mean, doing research, that is an engaging activity. It's mentally engaging, right? It's sometimes hard to see, but you see it in the output. Absolutely. And then we're going to be using rubrics to measure that, and I'll go over that in just a moment. Right. Uh, it's George Ku, and I think it, it, in, I can see so there is a slide at the end that has a list of sources, but I, I can send it to you, Martha. Okay. Um, it's high impact educational practices. 
And I think that if you just Google Ku, AAC and U, and high impact, yeah, because it's, it's, it's hard to see there, I know, um, that, that it'll, you can have that come up. I, I would say we have one that on this list that does not appear on the official list, and that is reacting to the past, which is used in history and political science, and I'm not sure what other um, departments. Yeah, but this has a very complex um, role-playing game that students use in which they uh, play a game based on a famous event or period in history. So there's a French Revolution uh, reacting to the past game, for example. So in our classes, we, just, uh, you'll see, we ask that you designate which one or more of these practices that you use. We don't say how many, we say at least one. But uh, as Scott was saying, it's not all fun and games. What makes high impact engagement pedagogy work is that it is effortful, but it's effort for a purpose. So we, that is meant to help motivate students. They know what they're doing and they know why they're doing it. Um, and uh, again, I think research is a good example of that, a way you develop a relationship with faculty and with your peers to work on a project together. But regardless, a high impact practice also involves giving students lots of feedback, helping students see how they can turn around and adapt and apply what they learn to another context, and then providing students to, uh, an opportunity to reflect on what it is that they're learning, who it is that they are uh, coming to be. Beyond the classroom uh, learning experiences, again, we are, we're just asking people to consider something outside of their regular class sessions. Um, you know, so one easy example would be to ask a student to go to a, a connection point event like the volunteer fair that just took place. Of course, again, you're not just sending students, oh, go have fun someplace. Go scholars, have activity. scholars Week is yeah. an example of one. Right. So scholars um, Week. Um, some of my students are going to the Albert Horn Research Center to do research. Yes, sir. Yes. Ah, yes. Indeed. Indeed. That, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure. They go. You require it? Yes. And they go? And they um, go? Then, yeah. I mean, it's part of their grade. Oh. So they have to go with their that part of their grade. Mm -hmm. You can also sort of do double duty with what is it, common intellectual experience. Like everybody goes to a performance uh, here on campus or attends a lecture. Right. Diane Nash, when she comes to speak for Constitution Week, yes, uh, somebody's coming week. to honors. That there's an honors, right? We have an uh, yeah, and we, and we have an honor speaker who's actually part of our MT Engage yeah. Week. So there are all sorts of ways, but yes, anything that's just beyond the classroom. But what makes it just, I think, um, for us um, important is that you don't just send somebody away and then they come back, but that that you reflect provide an opportunity it. to reflect on it. They have to then stop and tell you in writing or orally how it is that they see a connection between that activity and what they're learning in class or what they're uh, experiencing in their everyday lives. So we, um, as a program, um, have two different pathways. We're calling them uh, the foundation pathway and the major pathway. So, uh, we're not, I think we're, we're, you're, you're, what you were talking about for geosciences falls, I think, in both categories here. Um, faculty support, and that means that we support faculty to enhance existing lower division classes. Particularly, we've been focusing on University 1010 and uh, 2020, but all uh, gen ed courses that are being taught in your departments um, would certainly come under this. We want students to experience the MT Engage as sort of a formative part of their um, academic development. And then we are also going to be moving uh, very quickly in year two to working on uh, developing MT Engage uh, within departments for majors and minors. And by year five, up to the graduate level, actually. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I was wondering, um, when I was looking on the website, in terms of faculty support, what is meant by faculty support? Okay. We'll be talking about that, but we offer well, not just workshops like this. Can you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. But she's asking what um, kinds of support we actually offer uh, for faculty. So no, we don't just hold interest meetings like this, but we do have training workshops 
Next summer, we'll repeat our summer training institute in which faculty met for two days to talk about MT Engage and some of the learning research behind it, talk to people who've already been teaching in the program, and start to develop their syllabus and assignments for MT Engage. And we offer stipends for our training sessions, including stipends to graduate students or graduate teaching assistants, as well as to faculty members. So uh, for that training. And then so we, we want this to become sort of part of a faculty development yes, sir. initiative. So in terms of timeline, uh, I know that the lower division courses are targeted first. Does that mean that upper divisions cannot apply until later? Oh, you're asking or about upper division classes right now? Um, actually, I'm teaching one this semester, an upper division class that's an MT Engage course. Okay, so, so if you're so interested in that, we are too. Now. Yes. And get it. Right. Yes. Yeah. We were just targeting the lower division courses first. Okay. Um, right. So we have uh, almost 100 MT Engage sections being offered this semester. The vast majority are uh, Gen Eds or lower division classes, but we have 14 upper division sections being okay. offered. Yes. Scott, I'm going to oh, let you is this me? take over. Do I, do I get a clicker? Yes. You get a, you get a clicker. I think the camera still follows you, so you, gotta, you can't leave me. <laughs> so this is a really good book, although I've not read it. I've heard good things about it. And I, <laughs> I skimmed through it. Um, uh, how, to, how learning works. And this is where a lot of the, these elements from the rubric emerged. Um, relevance, connections, transfer, communication, and reflection. If you look at the rubric, I believe everybody has one. Um, got, got a little packet. You'll see these indicators going down the left, left-hand side. And the integrative thinking has its own rubric. And so it was really difficult to sort of have one rubric to rule them all. So we, we made some adjustments to the AAC and U rubric that was initially given. And a lot of that was based on feedback from fellow faculty members at one of the institutes. And the integrative thinking and reflection, it, it gives students these clear understandings of what is important in their course. A lot of times they'll take a course and they, they're like, what was the big idea? What was the big take-home message? And they often will miss that. Forcing them or encouraging them to reflect on this helps them give that clear understanding. Um, and of the expectations. And what the process of integrative learning really is. As professors, we often know what we want them to do, but they don't actually follow through with that. And so formalizing this approach of MT Engage is going to help students do that and help you help your students do that. And this self-assess, and we'll talk a little bit about this more, with the metacognition. So making connections relevant, I think this is the same slide. And so integrative thinking at the front end. So motivation, attention, and relevance. So um, how learning works again, student motivation generates, directs, and sustains what they do to learn. And expectations and values interact to influence the level of motivation to engage um, in this goal-directed behavior. And so that, this metacognitive buzzword has been around for a long time, really just a, a way for students to sort of much what are they, they think about what they're thinking and have this integrative thinking and reflection sort of has them do that. They think about what they're thinking, strategies, adapting strategies to perceive and to, to make them, to marshal them in one direction. And this is from, um, we went to a talk um, at the SAC COC for Terrence Doyle, and a lot of this stuff on metacognition comes from him. Uh, to encourage transfer and em um, emphasize connections within and beyond the topic of a given lesson. So you're talking about a lesson, and they're supposed to sort of be thinking about it. And maybe by going to some of these connection points or going to talks, they're going to start making connections that maybe you didn't even realize they were going to be making in doing this. So building the metacognition. So be aware students may not transfer thinking strategies far outside of the original setting. Again, often I'll give a topic when I'm teaching statistics class, and they're just localized just on that, and they, they don't want to think about expanding beyond that. And this is what the metacognition is going to help do. The ePortfolio is fairly new. You may have seen in your D2L shell when you opened it up a new little button called ePortfolio. And this is going to be a sort of a culminating um, effort of their work at the end. It's not going to be the first time you teach the class, your first initial um, MT Engage class, but they are expected to submit an artifact to
to that ePortfolio. And I'll show some examples here in just a minute. Is this still me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is a, kind of hard to see here, a guy named Nick. Um, created, he's a physics student and created an ePortfolio for him. And then uh, Mrs. Qureshi, I can't pronounce her first name, Machine Qureshi, created one that's sort of what they look like. It's just a web page that has all their stuff in there. And they can put whatever they want in there related to whatever they're going to be doing. So if they're going to um, want to submit their ePortfolio to a job, they'll have a, a special ePortfolio for that. They can select which artifacts go in there. If they have one going to grad school, they'll probably have one slightly different from that. And they can really tailor make it how they want to look. And so this is Rachel Whaley. And just sort of gives a sense of who she is. You, they've got links over here to the side. And all this can be done within D2L. And there's a rubric to evaluate this toward the end of their, their MT Engage experience. And they can apply for scholarships as well with this, as was mentioned. This is still Mrs. Whaley, just giving you a sense for what these look like. You can embed videos in here. Sales challenge video that she did of herself that she was proud of, and she put that, she included that in her, her e-portfolio. And then Ms. Kreshi's, all these again follow a certain template, a certain rubric that goes in and they, they just sort of populate it as they see as they need to. And there are people here, I believe, in the library that can help facilitate some of this. The digital media the digital services. Digital media studio, studio. Right, and the University Writing Center are both um, set up to help students develop their e-portfolios and to write for media presentations. Mm -hmm. So as an instructor, you're not expected to know all the technical know-how of this. That's what they will do, and Scott Hopped and people over at um, FITC that could possibly help faculty sort of help guide students to the right place. And are we going to play this video? Is that just sort of in there? Okay. Static. So she posted a video of her giving a, I think this may have been a Scholars Week, or um, no, this is a Capital Showcase MTSU students' research. And so she put this in there for hers. You know, she was doing grad school or a job or... You know, um, she was in the pilot study, so... She was in the pilot study. She's accepted to grad school, but she's delaying her admission. And um, I just heard from Dawn McCormick in the dean's office of the College of Liberal Arts. Now, she is going to be helping with a project called Launchpad, CLA Launchpad, in which they're going to bring liberal arts students together and try to get them to start thinking about developing e-portfolios. And so... Now, she was a nutrition science major, but a Spanish minor, and um, she's agreed to help with that. Excellent. And there's a, that a text that we've been recommending. I think we have probably a few more copies here. Mm -hmm. uh, leveraging the ePortfolio for Integrative I'm Learning. Um, that was really good. Candace Reynolds, I think, came and helped with the, um, the QEP for when SACS came down. And again, here's, uh, here's Nick. So he really liked this picture here, apparently. Sort of dressed up in a coat and tie, yet you still got the the ocean in the background. Mm -hmm. And from what I've heard, he, this really helped him when he went to a grad school interview because it forced him to reflect and to integrate all his thinking here. So when they would ask him questions, he was able to respond with really cogent answers because he'd already thought through it. He'd already written it down. Right? Sort of one of my English professors told me, writing is the pencil sharpener of the mind. And this makes even physics majors have to, have to write these things down. And Cole, for, so you can see there's a difference. They have a different um, design and different purpose. I think Cole wanted to be uh, a worship minister or yeah. something. Mm -hmm. And so each one of these sort of reflect who they are as a person and where they've come from. I think this is you. I think. Okay. But as, as Scott said, we, we don't expect um, faculty to, uh, you know, it's, it's, do all of the work with the ePortfolio. In an MT Engage class, um, you would have your students submit a piece uh, of their work uh, from what we're calling a signature assignment to their ePortfolio because there's sort of two levels of the ePortfolio itself. There's the ePortfolio when you just directly access it on D2L and it's sort of this big box, uh, virtual box to put virtual stuff in. And then um, students can organize it to make sense of it but then the, within the ePortfolio, they can create a presentation, which would be like the ones you've just seen, a presentation about themselves, tailored to whatever the audience is, whether it's Cole um, talking about how he wants to become a minister, 
or it was uh, Andy mm -hmm. talking about how he wanted to go to grad school and become, uh, you know, a physics, a, phys uh, a physicist. Yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, we do provide support in terms of knowing just how to maneuver with the ePortfolio itself. Um, and you may have noticed that you have the ePortfolio button for yourself so that you can create your own ePortfolio virtual box of stuff and your own presentations um, within D2L. Uh, and uh, Scott Hawk, uh has been uh, really just uh, so helpful to us in making sure that faculty teaching MT Engage classes uh, know about ePortfolios and, and have the rubric available to them. And he and uh, Jimmy Williams, who's seen here to the right, mm -hmm. um, have um, a, an ePortfolio workshop earlier uh, this semester. So we will be continuing with uh, workshops uh, for faculty, but also workshops for students, thanks to our collaboration with the Digital Media Studio and the University Writing Center here in the library. Uh, and uh, what uh, the folks at the uh, Writing Center have done is to create sort of a very specific section within the Writing Center devoted to writing for multimedia so that they continue to work on helping students with all sorts of writing, but they know that writing for this kind of an electronic presentation itself can be a very different kind of genre, and they'll help them to adapt it not just to the actual media platform, but of course to their intended audience. Um, the DMS, of course, is in the midst of becoming makerspace, and they, we are actually supporting um, uh, student workers with their who will work one-on-one -on -one with your students on their ePortfolios. Um, when students graduate or otherwise in university and they have access to D2L, is there a process where they have to go through the process of going through the process of going Right. Um, well, I think, let me say, say one thing and then try to answer your question. You know, it, you've probably had your students encounter this, right? As soon as the semester ends, they don't get access back to your class that they just completed. And they've lost their work in some <laughs> cases because they haven't saved it. So the ePortfolio, one reason we think it would be helpful is that students can learn to save their own work. But your question is about what happens once they graduate. Uh, and we are told that they will have access to this. That yes, they can export it out but that they will continue to have access to their e-portfolio after graduation. What, what, are, what are you doing programming-wise to encourage students to take an engaged site? Because my experience with ESL has been, I did I did I did So is, is the... Yeah. It's a certificate that they receive or an additional accolade, honor. It opens up more fellowship, scholarship opportunities later. Yes. And your, your question about how do we actually let students know that these opportunities are available, why should they take an MT Engage right. class is really important. Uh, I think college advisors will be critical on this because I know uh, many of the 1,900 students in our MT Engage sections are like, whoa, what do you mean I'm in an MT Engage class? What, what right. is that? They're, they're is that harder? That. Is that more work? Yeah, is it more work? What, is, what does it mean? That's one thing that they have. But I know that through ESL, there's an actual graduation designation that they get this pretty... Right, right. So, so I don't. I, I do think we want to appeal to students in terms of this is a way to get more meaning out of your education here. So, uh, and I think that's important, and that's one of the messages we're going to be telling them. You know, if you want, this is a way of deepening um, what the learning that is already going on, helping you to not necessarily learn more, but to think about the way that you learn in a different way. But, um, but. We're going to also be talking to them about e-portfolio presentations and how they can be helpful as they make that transition to grad school, to their careers, and how that also prepares them to think long-term about their careers. That first career might not be their career forever. I'm on my second career. Um, they are eligible for scholarships and cash awards as incentives as well. So that a student who has taken at least two lower division MT Engage classes and then submits an e-portfolio presentation to us, and we'll have a call for this next year, 
um, we, they can enter their ePortfolio presentation into a, competi a competition for a scholarship. And we will have one scholarship per college and one overall scholarship. It's a last dollar scholarship, but it will get them through the rest of their degree will, program. Will there be a core designation for graduation? And then, it, yeah, then at the end, they can do a senior level ePortfolio presentation to compete for cash awards. Then they will get not a cord like EXL or other programs, but um, an electronic badge on their diploma as um, an MT Engage ePortfolio student. So. No, no, and that's right. That is, it, e portfolio is available for everybody on D2L. It's a good question, and that's a great. And I think that is an excellent point because I've already heard from um, faculty and from college advisors. So I'm glad you asked that, Martha, because it's an opportunity for all students to have to be able to save work, create presentations. Uh, we're also going to be recruiting mentors for incoming MT Engage uh, students as we come along. So it's a, a, an opportunity for sort of student professional development there. But I think there are some benefits for faculty, and we do see this as um, something that is a rewarding way to teach. I mean, it's a lovely moment, isn't it, when you see that that light in your students' eyes and everything has come together for them. We live for those moments. And, uh, and they happen in so many of our classes. So our goal is to help students further along, because um, faculty are already doing this, but help students further along in that um, uh, enlightening uh, moment uh, development. Uh, but we also think of it as a faculty development opportunity, and we want to then support that through the, some of the workshops, the summer institutes that, that I was mentioning earlier, also through professional learning communities. So that if you think your department might be interested as a whole in um, pursuing uh, MT Engage designation for more courses or for a major, you can create a professional learning community. And we will support those financially. We are supporting two of the faculty learning communities that are going on starting this fall, for example. And have two that are just finishing up. I think that's right, Sheila. So how to actually get involved? Um, we have copies of our interest form. It's also available on our website. And if you send that on into us, then we'll stay in touch with you. We will have an ePortfolio workshop here at the LTITC. I have the time and date correct, don't I? October 5th, 1130? And then we have our inaugural MT Engage Week coming up uh, in which we are sponsoring events in all of the academic colleges and with a couple of the divisions here at the university like student affairs. So um, you have seen through the subscriber email an announcement about an honors college lecture. They're bringing in Tim Hubner from, uh, from Rose College, Memphis to speak. So we'll have a whole series of events that actually will last on through the dedication of the makerspace here in the library in October. Yes. So in the interest form, mm -hmm. one of the requirements is that we either attend the summer, fa summer faculty institute or an approved and engaged professional development activity. Yes. Does this count as one of those professional development activities? We would actually like to work with you more. Um, okay. So it would be something beyond this, which I would sort of characterize more as an interest meeting. But um, we, we are, have met one-on-one um, with, -on -one with faculty to do training. We have a sort of done sort of group sessions that we're setting up. And then the faculty learning communities themselves are part, are part of, would qualify for that. And I would really encourage people to think about those, um, and as well as the professional learning communities. And then we will have a summer institute. Are you, in, wanting, are you thinking about spring? You're you wanting to have a spring, course in the spring? 17. Yeah, so if you're thinking about Spring 17, let us know so that we would know how to put together more of a workshop faculty. Yeah, if it's just you, then we, we wouldn't need you. But if, there's a, you know, if there are three or four that yeah. want to do it or more, we could have another little. Because right. there's some training on the rubric that would need to occur and just making sure assignments are sort of aligned with the faculty. Right, so we would need to talk more about what we mean by a signature assignment. We could help, you know, you could bring in materials you're thinking about for your class, that sort of thing. If you're doing an FLC right now, that would be about MT Engage, that would count. Yes, so an FLC about MT Engage, like MT Engage best practices, 
We're also supporting the interdisciplinary learning communities, um, FLC. Those would qualify as the official training, as well as the Summer Institute. Of course, the folks who are finishing yeah, right now. Okay. Yeah, the, the 2017 Summer Institute, we know that you, no matter how we schedule that, we still might not get you. So again, we, we want to let, have, make sure you let us know um, how we can best work with you to bring you, bring you into MT Engage. Uh, but I also, when it might be about the mm -hmm. opportunity mm -hmm. for the professional learning communities in, for departments, because we have funding for that as well. So in psychology, if you, you've got a group that is interested in doing something like that, yeah. that'd be great. Right. I'm, I'm meeting later this week with people in business about that. Mm -hmm. So, other questions, though? Yeah. On the institute, did you say that was two days? Yes, the Summer Institute was a, a two-day session. We don't have the dates for that yet. We didn't, yes, no. we'll be working on those dates set up maybe this year. So, um, I'm very interested in this with the sciences and other people working in the core. Um, but our students learn um, similar concepts and taking skills and problem solving skills in different courses, but they don't necessarily recognize that they're the same. They're doing the same things in different mm -hmm. courses, responding mm -hmm. to different problems, type problem types. So I think it's the portfolio fits well for them in that respect. From the faculty's perspective, the question I get is, um, can we easily use the portfolios to meet um, the University of SAC's expectations with respect to assessing what students know when they walk? In other words, I would love to be able to use the portfolios easily. If I could use the portfolios, if we got every student in our department put together in the portfolio, and I could somehow collect data off of that to satisfy the um, the general. What, what we're now doing is a major field test. Well, mm -hmm. it's an exit exam, mm -hmm. which doesn't really tell us what we need to know. Um, I think it would be easier to get faculty on board with. I mean, I can't force any faculty member to implement this in the class, whether it's no, in no. the class or not. But um, I can most certainly encourage them to do it if um, there were an aspect of their class or not, where their class were part of the given program that comes to their motion. So that's what the I'm interested in knowing is anybody out there doing that? And how are they doing I'm not aware. So. I'm not sure if anybody, if you're asking about, could the e-portfolio be used for you know, end of program assessment? Right. I wouldn't see why not. I, um, EXL has an e-portfolio capstone, for example. So Carol Swayze and I are talking about how we can sort of watch the development mm -hmm. of e-portfolios over the next several years um, to dovetail our efforts there because they're on a completely different platform education and we're on D2L, but supposedly they talk to each other. College of Education already does all of their assessment through this sort of thing through um, live text. So, um, so I don't, I, I, I can never answer from the technology end, but theater does it. Right. I think both for uh, helping students get into graduate school right. and also for assessing their program outcomes. Right. So. So that the way I, I would see this, and I'm not saying that it's right, I'm just guessing here, is that just as when we say, oh, use the integrative thinking and reflection rubric for an assignment in your class, well, we're, we're not saying that's the only way you should assess your students' work. But if you use that rubric, what we'll be able to do is go sort of on the back end of D2L and pull some of that data back out for our assessment for our program, but you would have perhaps one or more other rubrics or ways that you are evaluating student work. So I would see that translating perhaps to the e-portfolio presentation itself, where you might have multiple rubrics that you use, we would want, for MT Engage, we would be looking at our rubric, but you wouldn't have to do that as long, 
Um, but you could assess their work using a rubric about what you want students to know at the end of the program, what they need to know and be able to do. Yes, I think. Um, it's kind of like a two-part question, I guess. If students are going to spend the kind of time to build an e-portfolio, and I know that you said they would have access to that for about five years, is, there, is it so embedded in D2L HTML language that they can't export it to make their own, like, build on their resume? Oh. Resume? No. no. They can. Yeah. Okay. And you may have already answered this, but um, really, what would, if you could say in a kernel, what would be the purpose of a, a faculty member creating a portfolio? Well, did you probably just say that and then that's it? Ten year promotion. That. Some universities use those in lieu of the big, huge notebooks that we develop here. <laughs> they do ten year in promotion. Yeah, because it. And there's some talks about that here. There's some conversations happening in the Senate, for instance. It's mixed feelings because I just went to the 10 year promotion workshop that the promos at, and the people on the panel, some said, don't make it all digital, that they want, they still want the book. Uh -huh. And we didn't have an opinion one way or the other, but it's just these so mm -hmm. I guess it didn't have an opinion, but they said, don't go in that workshop. But the other, I guess I have two kernels, uh, though, because I would say that, the, but the other kernel, I feel like I, if I'm asking my students to think about doing this, I'd like to get in there and do it for myself. It's making me stop and think about what they'll have to go through to put the, the portfolio presentation together, and um, I'm only about one quarter of the way through the process of developing a presentation, but, you know, it makes me think about, okay, well, what would I want to say? about myself if I had to present myself to some to a different audience and I'll keep so if you do something like that or your superior in the chair is able to log in or get invited to that book? I don't think so. Only if you invite them. No. You I can invite them. them. You okay. could invite them. What chairs might also be interested in knowing is that when they calculate your staffing formula that uh, Faculty and MT Engage classes count like EXL and honors classes. They get a slight, slight bump. bump. Yes, yeah, yeah. slight bump in, in, the the, in the staffing formula for those sections. So something that we don't think about unless you're a chair. Right. I'm sure. One thing I might add just real quickly. Um, you know, one of our proposed curriculum is actually started this. I uh, had one of her classes. Um, Make e portfolio, I think last semester before, or maybe it was in fall semester of last year, before the D2L link. Yes. Yeah. And so Google has a e portfolio format app. The problem with that is that at the end of the semester, she couldn't get access to the students' e portfolios on Google unless they gave her access. Um, and so there were problems. So if, if anybody, if a student comes to you and says, well, can I just make one on Google, that might be okay. It might look exactly the same as the one to make on as well. But if you can't get access to it right. as a professor, then it's kind of useless for, for a right. So yeah. we did run into that all the time. Yeah, and I know in public history in our department, students make them on WordPress, Wix, and so, oh, really? yeah. Um, so I was wondering, um, in terms of looking at um, how everything would be evaluated, um, so I see you have the rubric, rubric for, I guess, perhaps just evaluating. The, these are for the signature assignments? Yes. Um, so what about, um, is there a formal evaluation process for the whole, for the initiative as a whole? Yes, there is, and you're asking, do we have an evaluation process for the initiative as a whole? We do, because part of our job in implementing the QEP is to not just assess students, but to assess ourselves as a program. Um, so uh, we will be looking at our own data, and we have a leadership team composed of the leaders of the major committees that developed our QEP. We are also be going to be forming a, an advisory committee, to the, and they are charged, uh, both of those groups are charged with accountability for the program as a whole. We also have to develop a, a report to SACS at the end of our five years. So, and we will be part of the regular institutional effectiveness 
assessment here on campus as well. Well, be easily identifiable that they are registered or engaged. Okay. So how do students know it's MT Engage when they get onto RaiderNet, <laughs> right? Um, so it doesn't have, you know, say an H01 or which uh, for honors or it's R. Is it still they using the R designation for learning communities? They were doing that so. for a while. Um, but. It will be an attribute for the class, and so when they see it on RaiderNet, it will have, you know, the course um, number, the CRN, the title, and then there's that category over on the right that says what uh, requirements it fulfills, you know, degree, uh, general education, which part of it, and then it will say there, a lot we might also say EXL and MT Engage. So that's what they want to look for is, is that attribute there. They can actually search all of us can, um, RaiderNet or Pipeline, if you just you know, select the MT Engage attribute in that section of the advanced but search. Just, uh, yeah. A student registering for a class on their own, there's, there's no drawing, there's no impetus for like, oh, let me, let me grab this Engage course and they don't know anything about it. But if, you're, if it's a gen ed course and you're meeting for your advisor for the first yes. time. Yes. Awesome, you're going to have to get the advisor at the door to encourage enrollment in these classes. Because I've, I've had multiple occasions with multiple students who say, Why, you know, this is supposed to be a cell, this is supposed to be, I didn't need to register for this class. Right, right. What am I going to have to do? Because they don't want the edge to work. They're, they're like, oh, it, You know, is it something scary or different? Yeah. So I, I'm concerned that there's not enough of a draw for an 18-year-old college freshman to right. sign up for something that they foresee is extra or um, not going to benefit them in this mm -hmm. way. Uh, and actually, I share your concern. Uh, yeah, and I share your concern. Um, that's one reason why we were at Customs, where um, actually we had a parents, booth set up. Yeah, mm -hmm. we had a booth set up, and parents would yank their young people over and say, you need to find out about this, right? Take them from the rec center booth and take them over the rec <laughs> We didn't take them um, So we're at Customs that we'll be working with college advisors uh, as well to uh, so that they can answer student questions and if students want to, then they can help them find that section, make it well, work in their schedule. Okay, but the irony is that, you know, I do, I've done a lot of research in this area is for students that are at risk, this is exactly what they need. Right. Right. We don't have enough of a draw for them to do that. Right. And we were meeting with, actually, with uh, our High Notes uh, Office of Student Success talk about that. And we heard the, some of the research on this this past summer. Yeah, well, it helped uh, yeah, at yeah, the yeah, at risk yeah. students, and it helps everybody, yeah. but at risk students the most. Yes. Would um, the MCA Engage program kind of dovetail off what Mel has said? Would they consider some sort of certificate for the students? Because one of the selling points. Of we ESL. get of ESL. Because students said, why do I have to do this? And I tell them, whether you're an ESL scholar right now or not, if you become one later, you already have your credit. And you get a cord. And they like the idea of having academic regalia. They like the idea of having that extra piece of paper. The hardware, the something shiny. The bling, yeah. The bling. Yeah. The bling yeah. that goes with, you know, being proven that how I did this. Would, would the MT Engage consider, because it's adding on selling, selling yeah. for them. I mean, like, oh, I get a cord, how do I sign up? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If they, I get the certificate. If they feel like there's a, you know, they're concerned about jobs, if, I, if they feel like that's going to get their foot in the door for an internship or yeah. whatever. Yeah, okay. No, great, great. Can I ask a quick question about the rubric? Yes. At the top of the rubric, it says instructions, and I have it right in front of it, so if this is on the front, I apologize. Please select one option for each category. That is applicable to the assignment. So you've got things in shaded across the top and things shaded back down the side. But which ones are options and which ones are categories? Okay. So, I mean. so it says, please select one option for each category that is applicable to the assignment. And I'm not clear on which one is an option and which one is a category. Oh, okay. So on this rubric here, right. you have to select. you have to select this indicator. 
the, number, the, the last one, and uh, it's called Reflections and Self-Assessment. Everybody has to do that one. And then you pick two more indicators to do. So you have to do this one. You have to do the bottom one. And then two of the one, two, three, four. Two of the other four have to be selected. And two of the right. So this is something that's as the institute, right. right. Yeah. And, you know, and, then, and then you're going to, on the rubric, so you're going to choose two of these four, and then you're going to assess those mm -hmm. with respect to all of the possible. Right. right. So a student may be at, you know, they're incoming freshmen, they're in a freshman level class, they may be start here at developing or benchmark, right. and really not even expect to move to capstone. That's sort of like you're thinking senior, junior, senior level class. They've had four or five MT Engage classes. So don't, we don't want to think about this as a grading rubric. It's more of assessing their... Oh, right. Or to every or, assignment. Or every assignment, that's, right. right. That's why we tried to have some flexibility okay. here so that you know, it the, is opt-in. The devil's in the details. Once you start, okay, now I'm going to do it. How do I, how do I grade this? How, what, what kind of expectation does MT Engage have of, of me as a professor, and that's when, during the institute or a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me and Mary, will will help. I see, I see another question right here. I do. I have uh, many questions, but uh, they're really for um, probably for because I have more questions about the evaluation process. But that's probably something that I should perhaps inquire with the colleague. Whoever is over to, to that. Is that that's, that's us. us. That's us, yes. Um, so, yes, Let's, we can sit down. Okay, well, then yeah. at least I can mm -hmm. yeah. So, up to 3.30. Any generic questions? Well, we want to thank you for coming out. Been a, been a good crop. I think we had 17 registered and about 17 here. So Yeah, thank you very yeah. much. Thank yeah. you. And great. And good feedback. And I like that, even the, the yes. cord and the. Certificate, good idea. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.